Hey, everybody. Welcome to yet another night. Another night here of Incredible Week Volume 2. Incredible Week do Part 2, um, where we are bringing you more great guest stars, great conversations, um, and just fueling that creative need that everybody has. Um, once again, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us last night with our buddy Scott Inez, uh, the voice of Scooby-Doo and Shaggy. Definitely, again, check out his website, one Scott shot one Scott shop .com, um, and pick up some cool things from him. But tonight, our very uh, special guest star is a is a great creator. He's done some wonderful, wonderful works. Um, I mean, I, I'm definitely intrigued to hear some more about Elvira because Elvira is a great character, and she was just on a show last week. Um, Cassandra Peterson. But um, and this is also brought to us by our good friend Anthony Just over at Alterniverse. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to tonight's in credit chat. Um, Dave Avalone, welcome, Dave. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Cheers. <laughs> it's it seemed, like a good, it seemed like a good night to all open a nice bottle of wine. Oh, absolutely. Have a chat. Uh, ab absolutely. Every every night's a good night for a bottle of wine. <laughs> you, are, you are correct, sir. So, anyways, so, so again, welcome to the show tonight, Dave. Um, Thanks for inviting me. This, this could be a great time. Um, you know, let's start off for people who don't know about you. Um, and what you've done, Int introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about it, what you do. Uh, I am originally from New Jersey. I've lived in uh, California for 33 years since uh, graduating from Bard College, quite close to where you are in Wapakers nice. Falls, and uh, worked in the film industry on and off the whole, or I mean, on the entire 33 years I've been out here. I still am involved in that, but about now, six years ago, uh, I had an opportunity to on be working in comic books, and I took it, <laughs> and uh, that worked out pretty well for me. And uh, so, since then, I've been writing a lot of stuff for Dynamite. Okay. Uh, and uh, co-created something with Kevin Eastman called Drawing Blood, which I am the co-creator of, and I that's. A create what we call a creator-owned project, um, and that's the that's pretty much the main focus of my work right now. Nice. So you said you you mentioned that you um did some work in film, and um what what did you do for film? I'm very interested. Oh my lord. Uh, well, if you if you Google me, the first thing that comes up is my Internet Movie Database page, and I I encourage anyone to go look at that and have a laugh at uh. It, 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 it's either the sign of a disordered mind or someone who just was willing to do anything for a buck, and I think it's probably the second one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did everything. I was a grip for years, if anybody knows what that is. It's a lighting person. Uh, I was. Uh, I worked on the first season of the Power Rangers. Oh, wow. For six months. <laughs> uh, and then I actually wrote a couple of episodes. I wrote four episodes of VR Troopers. I actually made the transition from grip to television writer you worked for saban right that's for saban that was wow. all for saban worked with Ryan. and then uh was a film editor off and on for years cut about a dozen independent features my last couple of films were uh war documentaries i did a documentary about uh, the african-american troops who fought in italy during world war ii called with one tied hand made a documentary about uh, General Pershing in World War I. And I last, very last thing I did, um, pals with uh, Rick Elfman, who directed Forbidden Zone, mm. great uh, cult film way back in the past. And uh, he uh, it changed titles since I worked on it. I think it's called Aliens, Clowns, and Geeks now, something like that. Very Richard Elfman title, but uh, so yeah, doing that. And uh, last but not least, my most recent work on film, I've been friends with uh, Jill Soloway, excuse me, for a couple of decades through the LA comedy scene. And now she's a big deal showrunner and director and screenwriter. And uh, she was looking for comic book people to help her develop the Red Sonia movie that she's oh. working on. Oh, so there, there, that is in development right now. That is in development, and yours true. I worked on it uh, a couple of months last year when it was just getting off the ground, and about two, three months ago, Jill sent me a script, and I gave her more notes on it. Uh, very kind of her to ask. <laughs> um, but I think it's ironic that, you know, for years I wanted to be a studio screenwriter, 
if for no other reason than the pay, the mm. pay rate was better than the indie films I was working on. Never managed to do it uh, through 30 years of work as a film guy, but being a comic book guy got me hired on the writing team of a $200 million blockbuster film. So that's funny. Now, that, 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 now that's a, that's a, that's a nice uh, segue into it. I'm just curious now how, I mean, obviously there, there are a lot of differences, but I'm even just thinking writing a comic book, because essentially with a comic book, you are creating a storyboard. You know, you're writing the words that are going to go with the pictures and obviously doing a big film like Red Sonia, you know, probably having that skill and, and knowing that art it's, style. I mean, is they, great. They, they more wanted me, the, they wanted someone who was more, who was super familiar with the tropes of comic books and comic book storytelling and the history of Red Sonia and all that. And honestly, I, I, that was part of my life before I was a comic book writer. Uh, the transition from writing film to writing comic books, there are some cliches. The cliche that every writer says that I'm always, I have learned not to say, because artists do not like hearing it, is, oh, the great thing is I have an unlimited budget. I can write a page with 3,000 spaceships. And I'm like, yeah, but somebody has to draw 3,000 spaceships, and that's not free. Yes, it doesn't cost what it would cost to build 3,000 spaceships or have computer models made of 3,000 spaceships, but it is human capital and time and energy. So you learn, just like with film, not every scene can be 3,000 spaceships. You have to, you you know, you still eventually hey, people talking in a room uh, so that the artist isn't killing themselves every single issue. And also, I mean, honestly, it's better storytelling to very to vary things and not just go, I can have an explosion on every page. It's like, I, but that's a terrible story. Well, I mean, so, and certainly, I mean, I, I, and it's true. I mean, with a comic book, you, you have the ability to really space out and develop your story, develop your characters, really go for, and again, same thing with film with like those close close ups and stuff. But in the comic book, you can really get into those emotional aspects of a character. Oh, yeah, and it's, you know, it's like anything else. The trickiest thing to learn was fitting a satisfying story in 20 pages. Mm -hmm. And also, the thing I've most sort of struggled is the wrong word, but let's say wrestled with, is storytelling. There's the storytelling of the individual issue, and then there's the storytelling of the series and what the arc is doing versus what the issue is doing. The issue has to be satisfying, and it also has to be part. You know, it's not like you watch 20 minutes of a movie and then you leave, mm -hmm. and then come back a week late, a month later, and watch another 20 minutes of a movie. So it has to be satisfying in a way that 20 minutes of a movie doesn't have to have it as, it's a little more like television in that respect. Uh, well, like I've always, I've always appre—I guess to some extent I've appreciated it as in comic books, and I mean, I, I guess you see more of it now. Um, you know, like they'll they'll take a, like a, a six a six comic book story, um, and I mean that's 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 really an arc, and whether you want to call that a an hour of television or even a small film, because I mean now they're they're doing things and putting them into trades and whatnot. I mean, they've always put out trades, but trades are more uh, prevalent now. Trades, I mean, trades are everything now, and you, you know, you really, for certain prestige books, like I know that when Tom King sat down to write Mr. Miracle, he knew he was writing 12 issues, and he knew that the book would be 12 issues. Gotcha. Mine tend to be, the trades tend to be four issues, mm -hmm. sometimes it's five, and uh, it's market driven in the sense that perfect example, Betty Page Unbound, which was the last Betty Page arc I did. Uh, I wrote a very specific four issue. This is the story mm -hmm. outline and issue two. They said, Hey, you know, these are selling really well. Can you do five? And I'm like, it really ends in issue four. It really, I can't tack on another issue, but I've gotten good at figuring out, uh, epilogues and interludes gosh i knew that they might want to go past five so i was like i can do an epilogue to four uh that won't that'll be okay if it just ends up being five but i'm also then i have the door open to 
start a new arc after that. Um, so it's an interesting, so like the Betty Page Unbound, the first book's going to be five issues instead of four issues. Mm -hmm. like, um, the last volume before that, Princess and the Pinup, was also five issues. And it was the same thing. It was selling so well. They were like, oh, can you do one more? I'm like, it really ends in number five. <laughs> and I came up with a pleasing additional story to tack on the end. Uh, I mean, definitely they want they want to make that extra couple of bucks always. So. Yeah, no, and I and that's fine. It's just in terms of storytelling, especially those two, especially those two stories specifically, were not at all written to be open ended, ongoing stories. Now, had they told me before I wrote issue one, you have five issues, I'd have gone great. I can spread this over five issues, no problem. But by the time I had written issue two, I'm like, we're now on a track, and I can't squeeze an additional issue in. and this happens in television my wife used to work on chuck okay uh she was a she's a costumer at the time she was a set costumer now she's a seamstress and mm -hmm. what drove them crazy is the network would order 12 episodes or 13 episodes mm -hmm. and the writers would construct a season-long story that wrapped up in episode 13 and roundabout issue episode eight or nine, they'd say, you know what? The ratings are okay. Let's do five more. And then they'd have to dog paddle for five episodes, not getting to that climax that they knew was going to come in number 13. Mm -hmm. I always do it the other way where I, I go, no, I'm going to wrap this up where I said I was going to wrap it up. And then I'll just start something else. Have some Elvira fun. was the same way. Elvira was supposed to be a four-part miniseries. They told me to continue it in issue two. I went, okay, I'm going to do one. Here's, here's what the next four-part miniseries after that is going to be. And then there was another four-part miniseries when it continued to do well. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are all slowly rolling out in trades now. Mm -hmm. And Not honestly, I, you know, I would love to know at the beginning that it's 10 issues or eight issues or 20, you know, I would love to have that space. Particularly, I did a Doc Savage book called Ring of Fire, and I'm very proud of it. Mm -hmm. But if you read it, it's a movie with a great first act and a great third act, and there's literally no second act. <laughs> like, it's two issues of ramping up, three issues of wrapping up. <laughs> you know, three and four wrap it up. There's no, you know, the, the feelings that you, the kind of storytelling you do in a movie where you have a second act is just not in that book. Two issues of setup, two issues of climax. That's all I have. So, you know, but it works. Yeah, well, because that's what I was saying. Like, I mean, if again, you 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 know, you're writing for this arc, and I mean, I comics nowadays. That's how they're being laid out. Like, you know, when we were growing up, certainly, and even before that, comic comics were really like these short one. You know, you don't have to buy every single issue. You pick up an issue of Batman. Oh yeah. And middle and end all in one shot now there really is and i mean like you're talking about television television at this point now like that like again when we were kids we used to watch the incredible hulk you know he would he would get into this whatever town he is solve the problem and be on his way hitchhiking at the end of the movie and, and look i i definitely i don't need serialized television the way it is now. i don't need every show to be serialized the way it is now so it's common but, but, I, but <laughs> Uh, and they were talking about this with the new Star Trek spinoff is going to be much the Star Trek Strange Voyages. The, or, I, that's Strange the World, theory, right? Yeah, it's going to be about Captain Pike. They said they're going to do self-contained episodes, but serialized. And he used a great example. If I remember correctly, the showrunner, one of the actors, used a great example of, you know, Kirk has this incredibly emotional experience where he falls in love with Edith, Edith Keeler, uh -huh. has to let her die. And then next week, it's just not on his mind at all. Next woman. <laughs> and uh, that's the rules of television in the 60s. Yeah. And you could still do a, a non-serialized show and have Captain Kirk be at least moody next week. That he's he had a shitty week last week. Yeah. And it's affecting him. <laughs> and that's better storytelling. The I always bring this up because I evangelize for this old TV show. I think everyone's forgotten Crime Story. Oh, yes, I remember Crime Story. It's more or less, to me, invented modern television. A mustache. I can't think of who it was. Dennis Farina. Yes. Dennis Farina, who was literally one of the characters in the show when he was a young man. And and also, um, that's wasn't that the show where um, Richard Belzer's character, Munch, premiered, right? No, no, that's Homicide, Life in the Street. 
But did did Munch come on to Crime Story too? No, because he would have. It wouldn't have made sense because it literally was in the early '60s. I'm just, I'm just thinking because as, as no, I'm thinking, he's done almost everything, but he he did the X Files, but he didn't he didn't get on. Uh, he didn't get the Crime Story. I remember. He didn't get on Crime Story, but no Crime Story though. though uh, the wacky thing that is not commonly known is it's the same. It's based on the same true story as Casino, as Scorsese, yeah. you know. And here's something that will blow your mind. The part that's played by uh, Robert De Niro in the movie Casino is played by Andrew Dice Clay in Crime Story. I did not. Really? And the part played by Joe Pesci is played by Tony Dennison, which makes me go, in real life, either that guy was very handsome or very not handsome. One of those pieces of casting is terrible. I forgot like, the, the character he by. Oh, gosh. I can't uh, the, the real-life guy was named Tony the Ant Spilatro. Yeah. On Crime Story, he was called uh, Ray Luca. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it was all based on this one long mob story. And Farina was a real-life cop who in real life chased these gangsters. And he and his captain retired from being policemen and pitched a show to Michael Mann. And that's Crime Story. But wow. at point being, it was a deeply serialized it was in it was the first time someone said i'm gonna make a 22 hour movie for television mm -hmm. uh that really, really, what year really was that? hadn't been done that's 86 86 wow so because I'm, I'm just thinking about like you, you know you were talking about serialized television and star trek like I'm, I'm a star trek fan like i'm assuming you are obviously <laughs> right. about it. um for me like the the i mean ne like next generation i think at the beginning was not serialized towards the end yeah. it definitely became serialized um but for me my the first two shows that really stuck out to me as serialized television were um star trek deep space nine um yeah my, my i mean that for me that's my all-time favorite series and then um also buffy the vampire slayer mm -hmm. I, those, those are the two shows that really changed because I, I i dabble in writing myself a bit and like my, that changed my viewing habits and even like my my creative when thinking about story and things sure. like that. Because like you said, if the problem was not solved in a week. The woman didn't die the week before, and like everything's happy scrappy again. Right, and no, yeah, nobody, nothing that happens to anyone has any emotional effect on them going forward. And that was always a that was always a flaw in episodic television. Uh, like I said, you can still do Monster of the Week. You can still do Planet of the Week. But at least give the characters some kind of overall arc and growth and <laughs> you know experience that they've had, and it's not just like no, I'm the same guy every week, no matter what happened to me last week. Last time, I'm just and again, I'm thinking just like Hulk. I'm thinking A Team, Highway to Heaven, Knight Rider, all yeah. all these. Nothing ever, <laughs> nothing ever touched those people in any in any way. I was like, this is a complete sure, occasional two parter. <laughs> yeah. And actually, that's also true in comic books. You got the occasional two-parter. Yeah. Uh, sometimes even a three or four-parter. But you really didn't. When we were kids, when I was a kid, I think I'm. I think I probably have at least 10, 15 years on you, uh, if not more. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 43. I'm 54. So oh, I was. There you go. Yeah. All right. But uh, you, you did. You didn't really get long arcs in comic books. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'd get the miniseries that were self-contained stories, and that's, you know, part of that whole '80s revolution yeah. in comics, which I, I was in college when that was happening. And, and if you miss, my, find my comics at Iron Vix in Poughkeepsie's, which I Poughkeepsie, which I don't believe is there anymore. It is not there. We have dragons down here, but I've heard the stories of Iron Vix um, from our friend Anthony. Um, he he did tell me about that. So no, very yeah. cool. Wow, very nice, very nice. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, seriously. Like, it, it's it's interesting just to see the evolution of it. I mean, now certainly movies and they have worked out Red Sonia. So I assume even like with Red Sonia, they in their mind they're probably already even thinking like, hmm, if this movie does well, how are we going to spread oh, sure. this out and build our universe? Oh um, sure. Well, I mean, and again, especially when you know with Red Sonia, you're dealing with a character where there are three thousand stories about her. Yeah. You know, not it's not like well, there's this one good story and we're going to tell that and, uh, you know. So it, so yeah, obviously, drawing from the whole mythology and being prepared to go forward with it, uh, and I think you know, anytime you've got a character that you're fascinated by, I think it's pretty rare that you 
you think of a character and you go, nope, this is, I got this one story to tell with them and I will never need to tell another story with them. I mean, certainly there are, you know, the best example of that is uh, Dashiell Hammett only wrote one Sam Spade novel. Mm -hmm. uh, he never needed to go back to Sam Spade. There is a collection of short stories called A Man Called Spade. Okay. Supposedly written by Dashiell Hammett. I don't think I ever made my father prouder of me. I found it in a used bookstore while we were both together. Uh -huh. I picked it up. I read the first page. I looked at my dad and said, this isn't Dashiell Hammett. This is garbage. And he said, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> he was like, you spotted bad ghostwriting right off the bat. And I'm like, yeah, this, uh, this sounds like something an, an, an assistant wrote. And uh, Dashiell needed a book and put his name on it, uh, which is sad. Because his short stories about the Continental Op are fantastic and mm -hmm. some of my favorite stuff ever. But yeah, sometimes a character, you've only got one story. But all the comic book stuff I've done, I would return to any of those characters in a heartbeat. Well, I mean, it's certainly, I mean, and this goes for comic books. I mean, and certainly like you're talking about like the 80s and, and the 90s of comic books. Um, you know, like they would, they would do a book. And I'm just, I'm thinking, for instance, X-Men. You know, and I mean, we we know how the X Men blew up, like especially like in the '90s and stuff. Yeah. Um, but well, like, my fellow Bard graduate, Chris Claremont. Oh wow, very cool. That's why that's why Jean Grey's parents teach at Bard, and that's why she's buried at uh, at the Chapel of Holy Innocence at Bard College. I, that I did not know. Yeah, the last I, time, just as a side note, and then I'll just let you finish your point. The last time I was there for a reunion, someone had taken a piece of foam core and made a uh, Jean Grey tombstone with the X-Men X in it and put it in the Annandale Cemetery. Really? I was there visiting a friend's grave, and I was like, uh, and there's Jean, and there's, just as seen in X-Men 138, there is Jean Grey's tombstone. How great. That's that's really funny. But yeah, like, like going back to the, like, uh, again, using the X-Men, but I mean, even now, but like X Men was notorious for it. Like they would have a character, and it would be, uh, oh, everybody's digging this character. So now, cool, Gambit's got his own miniseries. Right. You know, oh, and you know, and I mean, same same thing for like television and film now is like, like, and they haven't done anything yet with him. But like Daryl Dixon from Walking Dead, like he was just a little side character they threw on there, and now he's the star of the show. I mean, I guess they're not going to spin him off because he has the lead in the show yeah. now. But, but that's, the, I mean, that's also the the mechanics of television that you can never predict is the audience is going to respond to stuff and you can ignore that at your peril. I mean, the best examples of that are both Star Trek and The Man from U.N.C.L.E. at the same time. Mm -hmm. The hero sidekick was the one getting more love letters than the hero. <laughs> so they went, you know, Spock should do more. You know, Ilya Kuryakin should be on every episode instead of handing handing Robert Vaughn a file in the first five minutes of an episode. And, you know, that's that's good. Let the audience tell you what they dig. I mean, it, you can take that too far, and certainly you've seen in the 21st century people taking, <laughs> listening to the fans uh -huh. uh, too far. But, uh, you know, because ultimately you should tell the story that you wanted to tell. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with, oh, people like this guy. And, you know, a lot of that is also you can't predict – what actors are going to click and what actors are not going to click and what storylines are going to work and what yeah. storylines are not going to work. My wife and I were, I think, I don't know what the hell we were doing, maybe surfing YouTube. Mm -hmm. and we were watching uh, bloopers from the first season of Parks and Rec. And I was like, oh, remember all the characters that they cut out of this show because they were boring? <laughs> like, Remember the guy that she was in love with in the first season who just wasn't that interesting? You know, no, I don't want to blame the actor for that storyline being uninteresting or him having no chemistry with her. But it's like, oh, yeah, we threw this in the trash and, in, and introduced three new characters of next year. Never heard of that. Never spoke or heard of that person again. Yeah, exactly. And it's like they never existed. And again, you, you know, that's better than, you know, chomping down with your teeth and going, no, I'm not going to let go of this thing that's not working. Um, you know, and I... I say this a little bit about uh, comic book creation. I, the editor in chief of Dynamite, Joe Ryban, one of his best qualities is that he never wants to waste my time. Mm -hmm. So he never tells me to work on something until he's one million percent certain it's 
go. It's a go project. The downside of that is usually that means that by the time I hear about a project, they want it yesterday. They want that first issue yesterday. So a lot of times I, uh, I've taken to describing it as in a lot of first issues, I throw lettuce and tomatoes and cucumbers and radishes in the air. And then I spend the rest of the issues running around under them with a bowl going, eventually this is going to land and be salad, <laughs> you know, like, but I'm going to throw all the ingredients in the air. And hopefully if I catch them just right, uh, and sometimes it works. Sometimes you introduce a plot line and you go, yeah, I really didn't have anywhere that that could go. Um, especially when a series doesn't go past four issues. I'm like, yeah, that's never going to get, that's never going to get talked about or resolved. But the other lesson that tells you is there were, there was a plot element, for example, in the Doc mm -hmm. Savage thing where there was something that happened that was never explained. No reader ever asked me to explain it. I was, I was like, I was mad that I didn't get to work the explanation in because it was a cool explanation. Mm -hmm. Never read a single review of it that said, now how, why did, how did that happen? I'm like, I guess that information did not affect anyone's enjoyment of the story. I don't think it would have been, I think it would have been better had that information been in there, but apparently not one reader went, I Ooh. don't understand this, or I need this extra bit of background. And you learn that a lot, that there's a certain degree of like, the story drags you forward. And there are also questions that people wouldn't, questions that wouldn't come up and people wouldn't ask or answer in the real world. And therefore you're only interested in them because you're God and you control the universe and you, you want to say, well, this is, this is why everything is happening. Every once in a while, go, you know what? That can, that can go out. That can, and there are writers, I think, as an example, J.J. Abrams is too big on, I, you know, I think he's a perfectly good writer. I like a lot of what he's written. But I think a few too many times he goes, you know what? This is cool, and I'm never going to have to explain why it happened. So let's just have the cool thing happen, and I'll never explain it. <laughs> And I, we haven't seen that recently, have we? <laughs> yeah. And the, and, and the thing about that is, I always say never make an audience ask questions you're not prepared to answer. True. Uh, so I try not to do that. If I if I introduce an element that really begs explanation, I don't let it hang there. But again, you learn what you can and cannot get away with. So I have a question here from one of our viewers, uh, Joe Ryan, and Aaron. I'm gonna put that up on the screen. Okay. Uh, and Joe wants to know. This, I'll, I'll take it out. It's the big one. It's covering our faces almost. But says, I have a question. I'm an independent comic creator, currently working on my first 42-page graphic novel. It was planned to pitch the comic as an animated series. Do you have any advice for an independent creator breaking in? Any feedback would be appreciated. Sure. Uh, let me start by saying that. Uh, as an indie comics creator, I cheated. My partner is Kevin Eastman. So any advice I give someone, it's like, you wanna break into sci-fi movies? First step is become best friends with George Lucas. It's like, <laughs> that's not very helpful advice. So meet Kevin Eastman and be his partner is useless advice. That said, uh, two things about animated, one is about creating a graphic novel uh, and then about pitching it. One, don't create a graphic novel just to pitch it as an animated series. I encourage you to love your comic book. Love your graphic novel. It's easier, in fact, to go forward with any project. Uh, one of the things I've learned from Kevin, Kevin has always been lucky enough that he could always say no. Mm -hmm. because he always controlled it and it was his creation. And uh, we the thing that we worked on together, we've been pitching it off and on as TV shows for years. Um, it's actually in a good place right now. We'll see if it goes anywhere. But we've always been able, if we are offered a shitty deal, we have always been able to say, no, that's fine. We love our comic book. 
and we are not interested in making our show bad just to sell it to you hmm. and making our project bad just to sell it to you. And you, you do um, see it a lot in, in Hollywood. Like, like someone's like, oh, well, this is a great idea. Let's make this into a cartoon or a movie or whatever. And, and so yes, it is absolutely a helpful thing if you're trying to pitch an animated series or even a regular television series. It is a very helpful thing to have a graphic novel, a comic book. And it also helps in the sense that if they like it, they like it. When we pitched Drawing Blood before it had been made into a comic book, we got a lot more like, well, you could change this, you could change that. When people see it as the what people reductively refer to as IP, mm -hmm. they kind of, when you, especially when it's gone out and people have read it and it's gotten good reviews, it's harder for them to say, here's what you need to change about it. It needs to be this and this and this because it's, it's a finished thing. So it definitely helps to have it. But my first advice is never, ever, ever make a comic book just to sell a TV series mm -hmm. because that's a long, painful process and you don't want to spend three to six months of your life and a bunch of money on what is essentially a brochure for a different piece of art. Makes sense. Love the comic book. Be behind your comic book 100%. Wish for success with the comic book. Uh, we had success on Kickstarter um, in getting a budget for the comic. Obviously, Kevin has a lot of fans, and that helps. Mm -hmm. But I'll say this. The comic that we were raising money for on Kickstarter was an adult story about I did kick, kick of, uh, drawing blood very quickly is a meta semi-autobiographical story of a comic book creator like Kevin Eastman mm -hmm. who has created something like the Ninja Turtles um, and as I always say yes Kevin has a zillion fans who love him but they love funny animals fighting crime they don't love the story of a middle-aged artist having a personal crisis <laughs> it's like oh you love the powerpuff girls you're gonna love all that jazz it's like no not that's not really the same audience yeah. so it, it's been tricky getting them interested in that um where was i going with that but uh kickstarter is a great way to not just raise money for uh comic book project but it also it gets people involved with you they mm -hmm. they take ownership of it in a really beautiful way and it means something to them uh that they were a part of it and they're part of the reason that the thing exists in the world the journey the journey absolutely and again there are ways you can involve them even more directly uh you know we had a fan who uh paid us a certain amount of money so that his cat could be in the comic. Uh, and it's great. And, you know, uh, and having a certain amount of influence on what you're doing and where it's going. But as far as independent, the real uh, crux of the question with independent comic creation uh, is publishing. Are you doing it for your own shits and giggles? And are you going to do it through Kickstarter and then print it and send it to people? Are you going to try and get it in comic book stores? Are you going to try and get it in your local comic store? Kevin in the 80s borrowed two or three grand mm -hmm. from his uncle Quentin, or maybe it was Peter's uncle Quentin, I can't remember. And they printed a couple of thousand comics. They sent it out to a bunch of comic shops and they thought that was the end of it. They thought they would never hear anything about it ever again. They never expected there to be a second issue. And to everyone's shock, the thing became very popular and they had to do more issues. Mm -hmm. But the question is, do you want to sell it to a publisher? Do you want to try and self-publish? Uh, those are all difficult decisions. And it's uh, there are independent companies that offer sort of OK deals, mm -hmm. uh, but very few of the companies that do creator-owned deals are paying you what the comic is worth up front. It's usually against sales. It's usually a pittance of what a good page rate would be if you were paying everybody that was working on the comic mm -hmm. what they're worth. So 
there's a little bit of a it's it is a long hard climb and i i respect anybody that wants to try to do it like i said i was i'm lucky i have a partner who knows the ins and outs of this stuff better than anyone uh but the number one thing i would say the number one piece of advice i would give i would guess is connect with your audience as much as humanly possible if you have any following on social media friend even if it's just friends and family to start with get the art out there tell everybody about the story get them excited about it get them interested in it and uh make them want to see it mm -hmm. and then put your energy into making the thing itself the one thing um, i guess you were talking about this because i actually published a a, a self comic book of, of some years ago about five six years ago i did with the buddy of mine and like even as we were going around pitching it like you said it, it it's it's work and essentially you're making that ip that 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 hard comic book that you're paying to really make a, a nice business card because right. you're sending it out to people because it, it makes a difference if you say hey you know what? i've got this great idea for a comic book or hey Here's my comic book. Right. And then people. Right. The, the, I would always say that the 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 greatest. I've said. I'll repeat it. The greatest power in the world is the power to say no. Mm -hmm. The power to say your deal isn't good enough. I don't like how you want me to change my thing. And if you love your comic book and you're happy with it as a comic book and you're not desperate for a TV deal, uh, I mean the great thing about the 21st century is animation is not a thing anymore where you need 500 people in a factory in korea making your cartoon for you yeah and you can you can find artists and major companies do this by the way find artists all over the world who are you know young and hungry and willing to break in willing to do a five minute piece, five minute piece here three minute piece there uh <laughs> major companies do this by the way mm -hmm. yeah. find artists all so that's the there are a lot of there are a lot of ways to go about this right now and even comic books i so many so many comic book artists are scattered all across the world uh because look uh it's we have the internet it's mm. it's a wonderful thing i mean i live in los angeles it's a wonderful thing that everybody who works in comic books doesn't have to pay what I pay for rent mm -hmm. uh, and can work for the kind of rates that the smaller companies pay. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I'm lucky that I have a I have a mosaic of jobs and my wife works and I can afford my rent in Hollywood, California. Mm -hmm. But uh, the first artist I ever worked with, Dynamite, great artist named uh, David Cabrera. I looked him up on Facebook out of sheer curiosity. He lives on an island off the coast of Morocco. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have no idea what his rent is, but he can afford to work for Dynamite. So <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's a good thing. But yeah, fine. The, 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 the number one advice of, on all of this stuff is choose your collaborators carefully. Uh, I remember Michael Stipe once said, someone asked him about, putting together a band and he said you are better off teaching your best friend how to play the bass than putting an ad in a newspaper for a bass player because you're going to be stuck with this guy if your band takes off you are stuck with him for the rest of your life <laughs> and if you don't know him if you don't love him if you don't like him a whole lot you are in trouble and uh you know kevin and i uh, met in 2015 and became fast friends uh worked together he asked me to work with him about seven eight months after we met mm -hmm. um and that's another you know while i'm giving unsolicited advice um i'm obsessed with networking because i think uh people misunderstand it on a fundamental level partially because of the name they think networking is you meet someone who can help you and you shove your comic book, your business card, your resume in their hand and you say, help me. And you have dollar signs in your eyes, giant big dollar signs in your eyes. And they see that and they hate you and they don't want to talk to you. Um, the thing that people say about show business is that it's all who you know. I think this is true 
across mm -hmm. most business. And what I always say in counter to that is, yes, people like to work with people that they like and that they know and that they're friends with. So what is networking? It's just making friends. And making friends in a, the more you can do it without the dollar signs in your eyes, the more successful you're going to be. So genuine, you're genuine at that point. Just, and I, I always start the, I've done a couple of talks on networking and I say comics, and this is truer of comics than most art forms because it is so small. It is a community. It is a very small community. If you are well liked in that, it's, it's easy to be a good person. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be a helpful part of the community. You promote your friend's work. When I have a buddy who has a Kickstarter, I say, hey, Rylan Grant's got a new comic called, uh, uh, it just premiered the other day and I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, my friend Rylan has a new Kickstarter. I'm gonna be promoting that later this week. He steps up for me, I step up for him. And what happens is ultimately, it doesn't take long for the people you like, who you treat well, who you treat with respect, to go, you know what? He's a pretty good guy. I'd like to do a comic with him someday. And, uh, you know, I think it was maybe the fifth or sixth time that I had hung out with Eastman. He was like, you know, there's a thing that I've been working on for years and I've never cracked it and I need a good writer. Would you be willing to look into it with me? But going back to the first time he sat down next to me in a bar in Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend. It was the farthest thing from my mind that the guy who created the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would have the slightest interest in ever working with me on anything. So we talked about 1970s World War II comics that we both grew up on and loved. That was our first conversation. It was about Russ Heath and GI combat and Sergeant Rock and the Unknown Soldier and weird war tales and all that shit. I didn't know that he was a huge fan of that stuff. And had actually bought a World War II tank when he was a zillionaire. Oh, wow. uh, he eventually gave it to a museum, I think. <laughs> By the way, long, long story short, comics is a community. Make yourself, and this is still an answer to that first question, make yourself a helpful part of that community. Meet people, go to conventions, walk artist alley, shake hands, meet like, like-minded like people. You do for them, they will do for you. And again, you do it from a place of being a part of the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's no, what works no, better than anything. That, that's, really, that's really, I think of some, I think of some of the advice that we've had on this show. This is, that's probably been like some of the best advice that we've heard because I mean, I can definitely attest to that too. Just I, cause this Incredit Chat and this Incredit Con thing, I mean, we're, we're doing these now because obviously COVID has shut down conventions. Right. But the thing is we, we're out, we are networking now. Like I, this is how you're, I'm in New York, you're in California. I'm meeting you. We're networking now, you know, and right. doing our chats. And even with everybody that comes in here and watches this, like we are forming a community. We are getting to know each other. We are getting advice, you know, and just talking about the process. You know, it's not about, it's not about making money. It's not about, um, you know, getting rich or, or, you know, getting to be the most popular comic book or entertainer. It's about creating good content and just meeting good people. And that's how I've looked at people, and, the whole thing. And, and look, there are, you know, I've known rich and powerful people who've been friends of mine for 30 years and never done a single thing for me. And that's also fine. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like I have friends that are showrunners on sitcoms who have told me to my face, they think I'm hilarious. Not one of them has ever asked me to write a script for a sitcom. <laughs> that's fine. I wasn't after that. Yeah, uh, And that's one of the other things that I'll say as an aside. You will never be able to predict the people who will help you mm -hmm. and the people who will not help you. You will never, ever see it coming. I mean, a perfect example, Jill Soloway, who I'm working with on Red Sonia, she had a partner in this uh, live comedy show, live storytelling show called Sit and Spin, a friend of mine named Maggie Rowe. Lovely person. Maggie and I made a hundred short films together. Well, not a hundred, made a dozen short films together. Worked together all the time. Came time for her to make a feature film. She hired someone else to direct it. Wow. That's fine. 
But if you would ask me in 1990, not 19, if you'd ask me in 2000, Maggie Rowe, Jill Soloway, 20 years from now, one of them is going to put you to work on a big studio picture. I just said, oh, Maggie Rowe, obviously. <laughs> Jill Soloway's nice. We get along, but, you know, she's not my close buddy. She, we haven't done a bunch of things together. We've just done a couple of projects together. You never know. And, and also, again, not bitter about any of that. It's fine, but you just, you, you go through the world, you help people, you work on the projects, you do your best, you try to be, you, you try to be, uh, what's the word? You, you, you try to live up to everything you promise. You try to hit deadlines and mm -hmm. the people that come to you and ask you to work with them are going to be the people they are. And you take it as it comes. Uh, I think that's. Like I said, incredible advice because it really, it really is true. You don't know, you don't know who has your best interests. You don't, and, and again, and who can help you, you know, and who is available to help you and what opportunity comes up that allow, you know, by the same token, if I had walked up to Jill Soloway 20 years ago and said, you're going to direct a Red Sonia comic book movie someday, she would have laughed in my face. And said, I, I'm not interested in that. I, what are you talking about? I'm an essayist. I'm a, I'm a television writer. I write six feet under. I'm not interested in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, the, the one thing, and I'm sure you'll agree with me on this, um, and, and we were talking a little bit about this, and for those of you who tuned in last night in regards to, uh, like, we, we, I had Scott in his last night, the voice of Scooby-Doo and Shaggy in a couple of productions. Um, these friendships, like your your relationship with um, Kevin, you know, and, you know, different people who I know and other people that you know, like, aside from that friendship, like, you know, getting to know people like that, you know, is, is humbling, you know, and, and you, 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 you appreciate that, you know, and because a lot of, there are a lot of people who can see that people's intent, like, I want to be friends with this person because my intentions are X, Y, and Z. Like, I'm sure so many people come up to Kevin Eastman and are like, oh, yeah. let's be buddies and... You know, and that's not that's not what you did. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't approach it that way. And you know, and there's just there's a lot of weird happenstance and coincidence with Kevin and I's lives where we've we've overlapped each other without meeting a bunch of times. So we have a lot of the same friends and have had a lot of the same experiences without ever running into one another, which is funny. But uh, but yeah, you just. You, you do your best to be a good friend and a good partner to people. And if you end up working together, great. If you never end up working together, that's great too. You know? and, out of it. and it's also, it's, you know, I remember being young and struggling and every friend of mine, my, like my entire social life was going to see Daryl's rock and roll band, which was excellent, but never took off. Mm -hmm. Going to see stand-up comics, X, Y, and Z who never took off. Well, one of those stand-up comics I used to see was Patton Oswalt. Oh, wow. Patton took off. Uh, you know, these things happen. And then you remember those people from when you saw... I've seen Patton Oswalt with audiences of 12 people. He's a good comic writer, too. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's terrific. Right. But, uh, but the point is, like, when you start out, you're surrounded by people who are struggling and doing things. And as you get older you you sort of it winnows down to the people who stuck with it mm -hmm. and the people who had the talent for it and the people who had the energy for it the people who could put in the long hours for it the passion and, uh, whenever you know i hate to sound like i'm name dropping and it's hard but when you've been in hollywood 33 years i will always mention like oh i know i know her and people are like oh my god you i'm like I've been here 33 years. You 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 can't not meet people. Like mm -hmm. accidentally, you will eventually meet people and they will be a part of your life. And you will have a lifetime of ridiculous experiences, especially mm -hmm. freelancer in Los Angeles for like I said, 33 years now. I've had a lot of time to have these experiences and to meet these people, and it all informs what I do now. And God knows, I didn't know any of this when I was 22 years old or 23. Uh, I don't know that I knew a lot of it when I was 35. <laughs> but by the time I was 49, I was starting to maybe get the hang of things, you know. And again, 
I also recommend completely, I started comic books when I was 49, learning a completely new art form that late is fantastic. It's like learning a language because I grew up loving movies and I wanted to make movies and I have been lucky enough to make a couple of movies. Um, but from a, ch from childhood, I watched movies from the point of view of how are they made? Mm -hmm. What does the DP do? What does the editor do? What are the actors doing? What's the director doing? I never, ever in my life looked at comic books analytically. And when I, in, when I was 49 years old, I got my first job writing a comic book script. I've never read one before. I go over to my enormous collection of trade paperbacks and comics, and I pull Watchmen off the shelf and go, huh, nine, nine panel grids. Who knew? I didn't, I never noticed. I didn't care. I was just reading it. I didn't care. Oh, Darwin Cook, New Frontier, three cinemascope panels per page. Fascinating. You know, like, and just, it's, it was wonderful to have a new thing. It's like if I took up oil painting. I have never looked at oil paintings from the point of view of brush strokes and mm -hmm. paint and materials. And looking at comic books from the point of view of how are they constructed so that I could construct them myself, like I said, it's a, it, it was an amazing education. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's really cool. I mean, like, 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 until you're in it, you don't know no. really what, it, what it comes right. down I just I never thought that I would be making them, so I never had to think about, now why does this work? Like, I've never thought about how, why a popular song works, either. Or how they're stranded. Stranded. Like, I know there's a bridge and a chorus. I have a vague idea of that. But until someone says to me, you have until Friday to write a popular song, <laughs> I'm not going to know about them now what I would know then. Because I've never tried, you know. Yeah, no. The, the one thing I did want to talk about a little bit tonight. I know. Wait, I mean, and this is this has been fantastic. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Um, the one thing I wanted to know, um, as a, as a writer, um, like you you said, Betty Page, you said Doc Savage. I mentioned Elvira at the top of the hour. Um, what what is it like taking some of these properties, some of these people? Um, and having to write from so like I'll use Elvira for instance like so Elvira was an interesting one because I had, done, I had done Betty Page and when they offered me Elvira I was concerned that it was I was like oh this is my niche now sex symbol <laughs> comic book character like I don't want to do I want to be that guy do I want that to be okay and then I went home and my wife said I love Elvira you're taking the job I went okay Take the job. And then I talked to my favorite artist, the artist I work with the most, Dave Acosta. He found out he's a huge Elvira fan. He's like, you're getting the job. I'm drawing it. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I'm a big, we haven't really touched on that. I'm a huge research hound. Okay. I always do my homework. Uh, I watched the Elvira movie. I've, I've seen it. I hmm. watched a bunch of her videos and I started thinking about what am I going to do with this? How is she a comic book character? What is it? What is Elvira? Like you have to literally, you go, what's the, what oh. story can you tell with this raw material? And I thought about the fact that she's a horror host. So that's when I came up with the idea that in the first arc, at least, she's going to be time traveling and meeting Mary Shelley and, at Growlin' Plus, I was like, that's a host. She's, you know, like, she's being introduced to the thing. Um, and then the second arc kind of grew out of the first arc with her going to hell. Which, again, like, you can apply her character to any circumstance because her character is so great and mm -hmm. so well-defined. So my number one job, and it makes me more pleased than anything, is to write something that Cassandra reads and goes, yep. That's it. That's me. Uh, and she approves all of the scripts. She reads but, but, That's how involved she, was she in the process. She reads every script, and God bless her, the most feedback I ever get is two to three joke suggestions per issue. Mm -hmm. She's never rejected a storyline. She's never rejected an idea. 
Uh, I had a great phone call with her about mm, maybe three weeks ago now mm -hmm. for a secret project we're working on. She went and she sort of downloaded all of her story material. She's like, this is, these are all stories I've wanted to tell. So hopefully all that's, I'll get around to all of it at some point or another. Uh, but the next thing we have coming out is pretty hilarious and I've been working on that. Mm -hmm. But she's a great collaborator and she's very supportive. She even, she always says to me, these are just suggestions. You don't have to take them. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to take your suggestion. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm oh, going to wow. take your story ideas. But yeah, it's a little tricky when it's a living human. Mm -hmm. And the funniest thing is that my impulse will be to be slightly more respectful and less filthy than she wants to be. <laughs> like if there's, I'll, this, is, oh, this isn't giving too much away, but I wrote a scene recently where she's in a hospital mm -hmm. and I have her get out of the hospital bed and she's in the gown and she changes into her dress. And the word behind, did I get left behind? Is in one of the lines of dialogue. And she says, oh, don't have me change into my dress. I should be in the gown that's open from the back. And while I'm saying, did they leave me behind? You should see my ass in the hospital <laughs> gown because that'll be hilarious. And I'm like, so my impulse was not to show her ass. Her impulse is, oh no, they show the ass. They have absolutely. So it's funny that that's sort of the relationship is she pushes me further. And the fun, other funny thing about the Elvira comic is every time, about once an issue, there's a dirty joke that I'm like, this is, I'm pushing it. This is, this is a lot for a dynamite comic that's not even really mature readers. Uh, that's always everyone's favorite joke. That's the joke where I click on the Elvira hashtag on Instagram and someone has screen grabbed that panel. And that's their favorite thing in the book. I'm like, okay, keep with the keep with the dirty jokes. But yeah, it's a. I'm very lucky. I'm sure not everyone in the world is as easy to work with on their licensed property. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it helps that. Uh, I mean, I've been a fan of her since the '80s, since the, I first saw her back in the back in the day. Um, it helps that we're on the same page. Uh, and I know, you know, as an example, Dynamite has the James Bond license. Mm -hmm. While I would love to write a James Bond comic for Dynamite, there's a part of me that goes, it's not going to be in the same experience as working with Cassandra Peterson. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of feelings about every page, every line. Rules. They are protecting a billion dollar 60 year old global franchise mm -hmm. that makes a lot of people's living is <laughs> off of James Bond being consistent and James Bond being a certain thing. And you buddy are not going to be allowed to screw that up. <laughs> so while I want that gig, there's another part of me that goes, you actually have it pretty sweet that it's just Cassandra Peterson uh, who you like and get along with and who likes your writing. And that's, you're not going to have that experience on any other licensed book, really. I will say the Betty Page, Betty's obviously been dead since for about 12 years, 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the Betty Page people also love what I'm doing, and they've never pushed back on any story ideas. Um, when I wrote Twilight Zone, The Shadow, which is a weird little mashup, I got some pushback from the Twilight Zone people on using real historical figures mm -hmm. that they were worried would be a legal problem. So I had to change. Orson Welles had to become Preston Springs and things like that. Um, and Doc Savage, I wrote a Doc Savage story where he did a one shot where he had an experiment that went wrong. And the editor said, they're not crazy about Doc Savage making a mistake because Doc Savage doesn't make mistakes. And I said, I'm going to write a speech on page one where Doc outlines how dangerous this experiment is and how it could go wrong, but it's so vital and important, I'm willing to take the risk. 
I said, that'll sell it. And they, it did. They were fine. I was like, as long as that doc knows it could go wrong, then it's okay if it goes wrong. But he can't make a, an actual flat out mistake because that's not doc savvy. <laughs> so there is a little bit of management of that. But like I said, honestly, I have had so much creative freedom at Dynamite. And I always say, like, this is the this is the part I have to, I would like to keep doing this for a living and I would like to make more money. So I shouldn't say too often or too loud that I'd rather write Betty Page than Batman and I'd rather write Elvira than Spider-Man. But uh, I'd, ooh, I'd like to make that Batman money, though. Um, but, but that is true. I, you know, there's, there's also a lot to be said for working with licensed characters that haven't been overexposed. Mm -hmm. There are not a thousand comic book stories about, uh, Betty Page. There yeah. was a, there was a 160 issue run of Elvira comics in the nineties. Um, I haven't read many of them. I don't know that I've read more than a couple of them. And it's not like they're so there. I have not received a single letter from an Elvira fan saying, oh, this, this, this contradicts with the established continuity. <laughs> no, what? there is no established Elvira continuity. My joke is always if Marvel called me tomorrow, if Joe Casada called me tomorrow and said, you start on Fantastic Four tomorrow, that would be a very big challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, because my first impulse would be, they fight Doctor Doom, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but, and there are guys, you're Mark Wade's. Mark's ready for that challenge, man. Mark is ready to do Superman for you, to do. They got new ideas about Superman and Fantastic Four and all that. I've never been exactly that kind of fan. I don't have 100 issues of Superman in my mind that I'm ready to do. Woo, let's go. I would have to take a minute and go, let me think about. Superman for a couple of days, and I'll get back to you with a pitch. And you know, certainly, and like you said, if you're working, you're working like uh, Betty Page, Doc, Doc Savage, and Elvira, and stuff like that. And you know, again, you know, not not to the level of like James Bond, as you said, but like here you have Elvira Cassandra Peterson, and she is trusting you with essentially her legacy. This is this is what she has built. And she, she, like you said, she's in the process, but she's like, here's a couple of jokes, go with it. You know, and that's look, I mean, big... drawing blood, the character is based on Kevin. He is very much not Kevin Eastman, but I have write, I have written scenes for that where I've had to go in the sense that this is based somewhat on Kevin's life and biography. This is a painful thing that I'm saying about Kevin's life and biography and is he going to be okay with this? And mm -hmm. every single time, he's, there's a scene in the fourth issue of Drawing Blood where he's uh, the main character's name is Shane Bookman and he's walking around a convention with a mask on of one of the Ronan Ragdolls, one of his cat ninja characters and he gets into a conversation with a female comic book creator Mm -hmm. who's young and who's got a web comic wearing the mask of one of his characters. And she doesn't know it's him. And he, she says something about the mask. And he says, oh, do you like the ragdolls? And she's, she's like, yeah, it's the, it used to be great in the 80s when it was, or in the 90s when it was edgy. But now they're, those two guys are corporate sellouts and fuck those guys and they're losers and whatever. And uh, he reveals himself and she goes, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, and he says, oh, no, you're right. We're corporate sellouts. Don't, you know, like, don't, you're not insulting me by telling that. And she talks about his publishing company and he offers to publish her. And she's like, why me? And he says, look, when I started in the real world, it was called Tundra. In our comic, it's called Siberian Arts. Mm -hmm. And he says, when I started Siberian Arts, it was supposed to be for people like you, young people who had dream projects they wanted to do. But somewhere along the way, it became a halfway house for middle-aged white dudes whose best work was done in, during the Bill Clinton presidency. And when I sent that script in, I was like, I hope Kevin's okay with me slamming Tundra like that uh, and slamming his own experience as the steward of the Ninja Turtles and all that. And he was like, I've had that conversation a thousand times at conventions. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Like... That's absolutely fine. But he's very, you know, Kevin's, 
I've been very lucky. He's a very good man uh, with a good heart, and he has a serious. You know, he was very young when he became a worldwide phenomenon, mm -hmm. and not everybody handles that well. And I don't, I can't speak to how well he handled it in the '80s and '90s, but in the present day, he has a wisdom about what he has experienced and a humility about how much he owes the fans and how much he owes comic books in general. Mm -hmm. That is a thing I try to model myself. He, you know, he teaches me every day how to, how to approach this life and this job with the proper degree of uh, com passion, compassion, and humility. Yeah, I mean, and that's, and again, like you, you need to appre appreciate all the elements that go into it, and like, you, like you said, especially like the fans. Yeah. You know? Oh, absolutely. That's he is just absolutely. That is a guy I've seen so many. I've I've been with him at so many signings. He gives every fan focus. He is. I've never seen him fail to make eye contact with a fan, mm -hmm. fail to shake a hand. Though we'll probably be doing a little more fist bumping when. <laughs> Conventions be open. It's that even right. He draws the turtle head sketch on everybody's thing. I timed him once. It takes him six seconds to draw a turtle head sketch. Wow. And again, it has it has to. Uh, if you think about it, he'd be dead if he was trying to draw a turtle head sketch that took thirty seconds. That's like year, literally years of his life would have been spent. <laughs> but he gives everyone time and focus and. Uh, gives them back the love that they give him, and that's we sh we should all be that successful in the sense of reaching people, and we should all be that successful in treating them like human beings when they come back at us. I was walking down the the bay side of the San Diego Comic Con once mm -hmm. with my wife and with a comic book creator and his wife, who I know. Uh, and used to be friends with, and they were mocking the people waiting online at Hall H. And I just thought, we're doomed without these people, guy. Okay? Like, you know, <laughs> you know, and he, you know, he was in the process of selling a TV show and all that. And I was like, you got no TV show if you can't. These are the these are our people. You cannot mock the people sleeping outside because they want to see Hall H. I couldn't do it. It's not me. It's not how I, I have never been a big fan of waiting on lines. I can wait and see the new Star Wars trailer on, on YouTube tomorrow exactly. instead, instead of seeing it in Hall H. But you can't, you can't mock those. Those, are, those kids are our bread and butter, and God love them. Man. God love that they care enough about the stupid shit we create that they will sleep outside in the damp air of San Diego Harbor just to be the first person on earth to see that thing you made. Yeah. That devotion is not to be taken lightly. Yeah. And, and, and again, we keep going back to this whole thing, like that, um, that gift and that responsibility that as, as a creator that you take on because. Yeah. No, we're very, it is an incredibly lucky thing to be able to do this kind of work yeah you know like, any kind of work where you get to have a creative idea and a week later it's real and a month later it's in a two months later it's in a comic book shop and someone's reading it that's a that's a remarkable gift mm -hmm. and i still like i'm new enough at this i'm always surprised that i have a single fan anywhere in the world when i hear from someone they're like oh i read your thing i'm like Really? How did that happen? And like, I walked into a comic book store and I bought it. I'm like, wow, you know. Yeah, and like you meant, you mentioned, and I, we go back to Kevin again, and you just mentioned, like, you know, they 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 put out that first book. They didn't think there was going to be a second book, and you know, the, the silly the silly little book about four turtles, you know. Yeah. And here we are. It's, what, it's definitely years? a joke. And <laughs> when I bought my copy from I think Iron Vix of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one, I read it. I handed it to my best friend who was another comic book fan. And I said, this is funny. It's kind of a half of it is a takeoff on the whole Frank Miller urban ninja nonsense. And the other half of it is kind of a joke on Chris Claremont and the teenagers who are mutants and all that. 
Okay. And uh, gave it to my friend, never saw it again. Uh, and it, that could be a joke about how it would be worth $100,000 today or whatever. But to remind, there is no way it would be. If I still had that comic book, it would be a CGC 1.0. Like yeah. There is no way in hell I would have kept it in anything even remotely like resellable condition. So I don't feel bad about handing it away to someone. 30 some years ago and uh and never seeing it again yeah oh, but i mean it, it touched you and i mean and you have that friendship now with kevin so. yes absolutely it, it, that and that's that that friendship is probably worth more than the money that would have even oh absolutely absolutely i was saying to someone that someone uh showed me a ninja turtles thing today and i said i kind of feel them the way someone's second wife feels about grown children of their new husband it's like I had no, I didn't birth them, I didn't raise them, but they're my partner's kids, and I wish the best for them, and I, I, I hope they do well, and I'm always happy to see them. Yeah. So. You know? uh, yeah. So um, we've we've gone over a bit an hour now, um, but I, I guess we'll start wrapping up. If anybody has any uh, final questions, um, and what I'm gonna do is also throw up here too. So if you guys want to learn more about uh, David and his stuff, actually, I put the long. Thank you. Link up there, um, but let me see if I can actually. Um, actually, what I'm going to do? I'm going to put a shorter link up there. But yeah, um, if anybody has any questions, Anthony from Alterniverse. Who again? Thank you to Anthony for uh, connecting uh, David with us here at Incredicon and Incredit Chat. Um, he's on here too. So he he was just he he said it was Vix. He um, Anthony just wanted to know a little bit about heavy metal. Will you slam heavy metal in the book too? I don't slam heavy metal. I don't talk much about, we haven't gotten much into the heavy metal years yet. Uh, we get a little bit into, uh, the, the character of Shane Bookman has a wife who's a uh, softcore porn model. Uh, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's not ambiguous who it's based on. And again, Julie Strain is someone I knew before I knew Kevin years and years ago. I worked on one of her first movies with her and liked her very much actually. Uh, but we don't we don't really cover the heavy metal years so much. And Kevin is still sort of tangentially. I mean, I think he still owns some part of it. He may even still officially be the publisher. But that's that situation is very uh, fluid. I can tell one funny story about heavy metal. While we were cooking up Drawing Blood, we were on the back to San Diego again. We were on the balcony of the Bayfront. Uh, Hilton Hotel, which is our favorite bar, the Odyssey Bar. We were talking about, we were talking about drawing blood, having just a great time. And Kevin looked at his watch and went, oh, I'm supposed to go to this panel now where Grant Morrison is going to take over as publisher of uh, Heavy Metal, and they wanted me to be a part of it. And Mr. Bad Influence, I was like, ah, blow it off, man. You don't, you don't need to go to that panel. You don't need to be dragged out as like the show pony of the outgoing administration like you know that's not good for you and he didn't go oh. <laughs> and his, his phone exploded while we were sitting there it was buzzing they're like kevin are you coming are you coming, are you coming? like yeah i don't uh so i take the blame and if you went to that panel where grant morrison officially took over running heavy metal for however long he did uh, it's my fault that Kevin didn't go. I, I was the guy who said, you know, that's not important. I, n I, will s I never would have done that if it had been Turtles related, if it had been anything that was like about his fans. But I didn't think that was, uh, I didn't think that was necessary. I was also being selfish. I was having a good time drinking with my friend and I didn't want him to, I didn't, I want, us to, I didn't want us to drag our asses back to the convention floor just for that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, no, we haven't dealt with heavy metal in the book. And honestly, it hadn't occurred to me to do much with it, but now I will think about it. Oh, there you go. So who's to see who's to say what will come next? So uh, yeah, everybody's thanking for all the advice. Another great evening. So thank you again, everybody, for uh, joining us tonight. And certainly thank you to to Dave Avalone um, for, for joining us. And I mean, check out his website. Um, Check out well, I'm Just Drawing Blood, check out Elvira, check out Betty Page, all, all the great stuff. And I mean, certainly this was this was great tonight. We went we went a whole bunch of different places. And I mean, we would love to have you come back again and we will uh happy to do it, Mike. It was a pleasure. 
this was great. And for everybody watching too, um, be sure to turn into tune in tomorrow night. You know, Dave was talking about artists being around the world. So we have a we have an artist, uh, Dave Alvarez, who I believe he's in Puerto Rico, um, and he draws. He does a lot of Looney Tunes stuff. So he's with us tomorrow. We'll have another day tomorrow. Um, so once again, thank you everybody for coming to In Credit Chat tonight, and we will see you tomorrow. See you guys all later. Just wait one second.